Good morning. May the Lord be with you. We welcome you to uh, church, the Presbyterian Church of Wilmington on Pentecost Sunday, and I see a number of you have worn red to celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit. I'm glad that you've done that. We're glad you're here on this very special day. Uh, just several announcements. First of all, our Pentecost offering, which supports ministries with youth and young adults. You know about it. I wrote about it in the weekly epistle. And uh, offering envelopes are in your bulletin. Offering envelopes, of course, can go on the table in the offering plate at the back of the aisle. Uh, a service of celebration of the life of Tom Middleton will be held next Sunday, June 12, 4 p.m. at the, at the uh, Middleton Barn on Wilson Road. And the congregation is invited to come and celebrate Tom's long and full life. We want to thank uh, Avery and Janice for the flowers and wish them a happy, what, 68th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. <laughs> I want to share the very good news that the campaign to raise money for our handbells to be refurbished uh, for, in honor of Sandy Wiggett has reached a total of $4,665, which is $1,000. The handbell players are, are applauding. The, the bell ringers like that. Uh, that's $1,665 ahead of our, ab above our goal. So the uh, uh, music staff will be able to use those monies for additional items to, uh, uh, and additional supplies like new music stands for the handbell choir and things of that nature. So we're grateful for that. Thank you for your generosity. Uh, and of course, today's a special day for Sarah as we, she's our, our sole graduate this year, but she graduated from the uh, university, not University of Dubuque. Dubuque Theological. Yeah, Dubuque Theological Seminary, having completed, completed the course of study that leads to being certified as a ruling elder or we, what we used to call lay pastor. So Sarah, we congratulate you. And Sarah will be presiding at the communion table. There are instructions in the bulletin about that, but she'll explain more at the time. Um, and after the service, there'll be a reception in her honor in the fellowship hall, and you all are invited, and I hope you'll stay and, and join us for that. Uh, prayer concerns. Sandy's actually doing pretty well right now. Uh, I saw her on Wednesday. A couple people went out to see her on Friday. She's uh, uh, feeling good. She's bored, though. She'd like to be out doing more. And, but, but that's the Sandy we know and love, right? Uh, uh, Helen Middleton was in the hospital after a a fractured hip and surgery, but she's now in rehab. She's at uh, the rehab center that used to be called Drake in Cincinnati. I don't know what it's called now, but uh, the name has evidently changed. I remember going there years ago to visit uh, Mount Pleasant residents. Uh, and uh, Anna May uh, got out of the hospital and is at uh, rehab at Cape May. And uh, we also learned this morning that Ron Scheidecker had a stroke, and so he's at Miami Valley Hospital, so keep Ron and his family in your prayers. And I think those are all the announcements, and Sarah, it's your turn. Good morning. Um, my one announcement is that Timber Faith is hiring a co-teacher and so if you know someone who wants to spend three or four hours a day, four to three, three to five times a week, um, and have the most fun and the most giggles they've ever had in their life with four-year-olds, please let me know and email me. Um, let me know afterwards, but have them email me. We're interviewing next week for the next two weeks. And I, I do want to say thank you. Uh, it's a little embarrassing to have, you know, the fancy tablecloths on the table and, and cookies and, and things for me. But I am very grateful, and I'm grateful. The celebration is fun, but your prayerful support and your words of encouragement over the last two years have been sustaining and energy-giving and have truly made this journey um, not only possible, but enjoyable. And I have loved every minute of, of my classes and, and the readings and not so much the papers I wrote late at night, but 
everything else but that. I've loved every minute of it. And so I have my deepest appreciation to each of you for your, your support. Thank you. See, there's no choir today to do the intro. Did you notice how I left as if there were? Now, if they were here, I would have gone right to the call to worship. Friends, we are here to worship God. We are here to celebrate this amazing day of creation. And as God's people, would you stand and join me, please, in the call to worship? We are Easter people. We have witnessed the resurrection of our Lord. Now we are called to be the people of Pentecost. We are called to boldly share the good news of God's love. Open your hearts, O oh people, to God's great power and love. We open our hearts to hear God's word for us and to joyfully proclaim Jesus Christ as our Savior. Friends, turn to um, hymn number 130, Let Every Christian Pray. Jesus says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me. Out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Please join as we pray the prayer of confession. Almighty God, you poured your spirit upon gathered disciples, creating bold tongues, open ears, and a new community. We confess that we too often hold back the force of your spirit among us. We do not listen for your word of grace, speak the good news of your love, or live as a people made one in Christ. Have mercy on us, O God. Transform our timid lives by the power of your spirit and fill us with a flaming desire to be your faithful people doing your will for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please pray silently.
Through Christ, God has poured out the Holy Spirit upon us for the forgiveness of sins. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Please share the greeting of peace with those around you. sit down if you want. William, do you want to sit down? I'm going to talk to you for just a minute. Like I have two things, three things I want to say. Friends, it's good to see you. Good morning. I have a question. How many of you can do a cartwheel? You can do a cartwheel? Can you do a cartwheel? Can you do one, Amelia? I can't either. How about you, Hannah? What? Can you do a cartwheel? I like him. Well, I can't do a cartwheel. Now, I've tried, maybe. You, but see, I almost did, too. Austin said he almost died trying to do a cartwheel. <laughs> High five, because that's my life. I, um, I can't, and I've tried really hard, though, and I really, I didn't give up until in my 40s, uh, a while ago. But we try. How about riding a bike? Can you ride a bike, Hannah? Can you, Amelia, can you ride a bike? Can, do you ride a bike? I bet you do. Do you ride a bike? Yep, yep, yep. I can also ride a bike. My question is, did you take off on two wheels the very first time you tried? No. Well, no way. I, I did. You did? Uh-huh, okay. <laughs> it's important that we know that. It takes a while, doesn't it? We have to practice. Most things in life are, <laughs> most things in life take practice. Most things in life take practice. And what I want to tell you that just like riding a bike, it takes some time. And sometimes you fall, and sometimes you get discouraged, you may want to quit. But you can do hard things, okay? I want you to say that. Say what I say. I can do hard things. Hard things. I just got done with a program that took two years, and I only took two classes a semester. But it was eight total classes, but they were college classes. And it's been decades since I was in college. And it was hard, and there were times I thought, there's no way. I'm going to have to take a break. And, but I did it. 
and I did a hard thing, and you can do a hard thing. But do you know what the beautiful part of doing hard things is? You can't, you, right? You can do them again, and you never, you never give up what you've learned. It's always with you. That's important. But you don't do them alone. You don't do hard things alone. You always have God beside you. You always have the promises of Jesus. Jesus said, I will never leave you. I am with you always. Now, we know Jesus in the flesh is not sitting in our congregation. But on this day of Pentecost, we learn about the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of God. And that Spirit is with us all the time. So when you are falling off your bike, the Spirit of God is there to comfort you. And when you get discouraged, the Spirit of God is there to encourage you. And the way the Spirit does that, oftentimes, is through people. God sends people into our life that speak blessing to us. They say, you can do it. I believe in you. Keep trying. I'm proud of you. Those people are the gift of God, and they speak the spirit of encouragement into your life. Friends, you can do hard things, and you can do them knowing you have the Spirit of God with you all the time. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. That's exciting news, don't you think? Let's pray. Dear God, Thank you for being with me always. Thank you for sending people who love me and people who encourage me. Help me shine your light in all the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, friends, we're not going to Sunday school since I'm participating in church today, but you can, you should all have your little packets for Pentecost. You can go back and sit with your families. Our first lesson today is from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Listen now to the word of God from Acts. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and 
proselytes, Cretans, and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy." And I will show portents in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, good job, and thank you very much for doing that. Well, the gospel reading is one page before the first reading. <laughs> How ironic. John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. Let us hear the gospel of the Lord as Jesus, as we read about Jesus appearing to the disciples and giving them the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. In the stillness of this moment, speak to us, Lord, and let us listen for your still, small voice come to, uh, coming to us both in the scripture read and proclaimed. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Presbyterians, as you know, are noted for doing things decently and in order. But Luke's account of the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 is anything but decent and orderly. It is a story of sheer pandemonium, gale force winds filling the house, tongues of fire sweeping down from above and settling over the heads of the disciples and all of them breaking forth, speaking euphorically in languages that they had never bothered to learn in school. The house can no longer contain this tumult and so neither the people nor the spirit. There's no longer room for any of them. And so they move out into the streets where the attention of the public is attracted and the disciples are thrust out into public view proclaiming a message in foreign languages and the scene is one of confusion and chaos. It is noisy, it is messy, it is disorderly, way too exciting for we stayed Presbyterians. So I can understand if this morning you find yourself drawn to John chapter 20's more sedate account where it simply says Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. There's a, an appeal to that Pentecost story. That's John's Pentecost story, by the way. It, it, it appears to be more suitable for Presbyterians. And I actually thought of, I've preached on that story before and called it Pentecost for Presbyterians. And I thought of doing so today, but it seems to me that Luke's wild, unruly account has a very important message for us at this juncture in the history of the Presbyterian Church of Wilmington. In the movie Tucker, The Man and His Dream, Preston Tucker dreams of building the car of the future. In pursuit of his dream, Tucker enlists Abe, a designer who is a most reluctant partner. Abe tries to explain why he wishes he wasn't working with Tucker, and he says, when I was a little kid, maybe five years old in the old country, my mother used to say to me, she'd warn me, don't get too close to people, you'll catch their dreams. Years later, I realized that I had misunderstood her. Germs, she said, not dreams. You'll catch their germs. Well, as we know, germs are more easily caught than dreams. But think of all the things that people dream about. People who buy lottery tickets, which is not me, by the way, dream of winning the Powerball jackpot. Young singers dream of winning The Voice or being the next American Idol. High school seniors dream of getting into the college of their choice, be it Harvard, Princeton, or Yale, or closer to home, Miami, or The Ohio State University. College seniors dream of a job offer that will enable them to pay off their student loans. Young lovers dream of finding the perfect partner. Young basketball players dream of being the next Michael Jordan, LeBron James, or Stephon Curry. Michael Jordan, ironically, actually dreamed of being a baseball player. He tried it for a while and ended up going back 
to basketball, then the results were pretty good. Even, even ministers are known to dream. Did you know that, that ministers are known to dream? That's right. They, they dream of denominational meetings in Hawaii. <laughs> they, they dream of congregations that fill up the front pews first. They dream of church members who say things like, Pastor, I just can't wait to increase my pledge. Or, Pastor, I'd just love to serve on the nominating committee. That's for you, Bruce Saunders. <laughs> Sigmund Freud argued that every dream is a wish, thus giving us another reason to ignore Sigmund Freud. Dreams can be both a blessing and a curse. While, others seem, while some seem to have only happy dreams, others have dreams that are dark and threatening, more like nightmares. People who've been through a tragedy have their dreams consumed by the trauma. Soldiers suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome will have nightmares of the buddies they lost in war. People who grieve a loved one who have died will often dream of that person causing both sadness and joy. The Washington Post reported last weekend that students who've survived a mass shooting at their school will be haunted for years by what they saw or heard or lost. So who inhabits your dreams? What shapes your visions? Who fills your hopes and wishes? The dreams of God's people must always come from God. And so in the midst of that Pentecostal pandemonium, Peter stands up. Now this is the same Peter who about 50 days earlier shrank in fear when a servant girl asked him if he had been with Jesus of Nazareth. And now that same Peter, filled with an infusion of power from on high, finds his voice to proclaim the gospel with passion, power, and volume. This same man who had argued with Jesus about his crucifixion, who on the Mount of Transfiguration misunderstood the mission of Jesus, and who three times denied even knowing him, at Pentecost, Peter becomes the preacher who boldly and fearlessly proclaims the good news of Jesus Christ. So standing amid a veritable United Nations of people, Peter says, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The Pentecost Day vision is of all people sharing in the outpouring of God's spirit. Old and young, female and male, rich and poor, black, white, and brown, all share in the joy as God leads them to dream as God's spirit comes to them, fills them, and leads them to dream. Peter says, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And he was not talking about the kind of dreams that most people have, like, well, for example, dreams of hitting it big in Bitcoin, or taking a cruise around the world, or riding the SpaceX rocket to the moon. He was talking about the God kind of dreams, dreams that inhabit our every waking moment and cause us to pay any price to make that dream become reality. And God's dreams are not meant to be dreamt alone, but in a diverse community that is united in one spirit. This task of dreaming involves all of who we are. We hear it and feel it like the howling of a fierce wind. We see it and feel it like individual flames of fire. We speak it in our own native language, yet it is understood by foreigners. This Pentecost event, the Spirit poured out among the people, grounds us in the past with the words of the prophet Joel and launches us into the future with a call to dream dreams and see visions. We are reminded that the Spirit who was present at Pentecost is the same Spirit who is present with us here and now. Therefore, we are connected to that same call to live out a life of faithfulness in which dreams and visions may yet soar. Our call is to continue to lay the groundwork and provide the space 
so our dreams can blossom in others. And Peter makes one thing clear above all else. You can never be too young to have visions of what God might do. And you can never be too old to dream God's dreams. Now, have you ever noticed the prominent place of dreams in the Bible? Think of all of our ancestors in the faith who followed their dreams. Jacob, who named the place of his dream where he saw a ladder between heaven and earth and the angels going up and down it, he named that place Bethel, house of God. Joseph, who was able to interpret Pharaoh's dreams and thereby ensure the survival not only of the Egyptian people, but also of his own family. Another Joseph who obeyed the dream that told him to take a pregnant Mary as his wife and thereby provided a family for God's son. Paul, who dreamed of a man from Macedonia calling him to bring the message of Jesus to new territories and who in the dire situation of a storm at sea when the entire crew and members uh, or passengers were threatened with drowning in the sea as the ship sank, he had a dream and that dream that gave, was able to give comfort and peace to the passengers and the crew. St. Francis of Assisi, who dreamed of a God who embraced all creatures in love and compassion. Martin Luther King Jr., who dreamed of a world where people were not judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Sadly, Dr. King did not live to see his dream fulfilled. We still live in a world where too many people judge others by their race, their religion, their ethnicity, or their lifestyle. Our heritage as God's people is that of dreamers. Dreams are part of our spiritual DNA. Too often people look at the church and say, see how they fight? Wouldn't it be wonderful if people looked at the church and said, see how they dream? In The Man of La Mancha, Don Quixote is talking to the Duke who has accused him of being an unrealistic idealist. And the Duke says, why are you poets so fascinated with madmen? Quixote replies, I suppose we have much in common. The Duke says, you both turn your backs on life. And Quixote says, we both select from life what pleases us. And the Duke says, a man must come to terms with life as it is. And Quixote goes on to say, and it's a long quote, so bear with me. I have lived nearly 50 years, and I have seen life as it is. Pain, misery, hunger, cruelty beyond belief. I've heard the singing from taverns and the moans from bundles of filth in the streets. I've been a soldier and seen my comrades fall in battle. I've, been hel I've held them in my arms at the final moment. These were men who saw life as it is, yet they died despairing. No glory, no gallant last words, only their eyes filled with confusion, whimpering the question, why? I don't think they asked why they were dying, but why they had lived. When life itself becomes lunatic, who knows where madness lies? Perhaps to be too practical is madness. To surrender dreams, this may be madness. To seek treasure where there's only trash. Too much sanity may be madness, and maddest of all, to see life as it is and not as it should be. God's people dream of life as it should be. To paraphrase Bobby Kennedy, who was actually paraphrasing George Bernard Shaw, they have visions of things that are not and ask, why not? In a commencement speech at Sarah Lawrence College, the great novelist Toni Morrison talked about what it means to dream God's dreams. She said, not idle, wistful dreaming, but engaged, direct, daytime visions of unusual vividness, clarity, order, and significance are demanded of us. Dreaming God's kinds of dreams can be difficult and demanding. There's no guarantee that we will ever be able to see our dreams fulfilled. As Dr. King reminded us, sometimes dreams can be deferred and justice can be delayed. In a sermon entitled Shattered Dreams, King said, one of the most agonizing problems within our human experience 
is that few, if any of us, live to see our fondest hopes fulfilled. Some dreams won't come true, but if they are God's dreams, then we should keep on dreaming them. When we dream God's dreams, the wind of the Spirit will blow into our lives and into our church and make all things new. In his book, A Life on the Road, journal, journalist Charles Kuralt, you perhaps remember him, he was on CBS News, host of the CBS Sunday Morning News Show for many years. In his book, he told of a woman who dreamed God's dream. It was the spring of 1968. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Bobby Kennedy was murdered. If you're my age and older, you recall that it was a very dark time in American history. Kuralt was feeling depressed about the future of the country. And then in Reno, Nevada, he met Pat Shannon Baker. Pat was a young white woman, the mother of three children. The night Martin Luther King Jr. was killed, she stayed up late thinking that she had to do something. But what? She remembered a vacant lot she passed every day in the city. It would make a nice park, she thought. She went to see her city councilman who said that it would take a bond issue and, and that would be unlikely to happen. So Pat Baker went on her own to see the African-American neighbors surrounding that vacant lot. She went to garden supply companies and cement companies and heads of construction unions and contracting companies. And pretty soon her dream for that lot became their dream also. And so after many months of preparation at 7.30 on a Friday morning, at a time when many Reno residents were not yet stirred from their beds and a crowd began gathering on that vacant lot. By 8.30, 2,000 tons of topsoil were being spread by heavy equipment operators all working for free. Charles Kuralt stood and watched. He, he could hardly believe his eyes. He watched a school custodian, a roofer, a garage mechanic, and an unemployed teenager digging a ditch together. A junior high school boy sawed all day in the hot sun as if his life depended on it. A little girl carried water to the workers. Even some Marines and Seabees stopped by to help. By noon, concrete was poured for a double tennis court. A basketball court had been installed by the time the sun went down. Dozens of people worked on through the night. On Saturday morning, a crowd of people again showed up. An 84-year-old man who came to watch spent the entire afternoon helping to plant trees. By Saturday night, sod had been laid, and on Sunday morning, a sprinkler system was turned on. And by Sunday afternoon, the park was finished, complete with walks, benches, trees, playing courts, and lights. 20 years later, Charles Kuralt returned to that park in Reno. He said the grass was neatly trimmed and the trees had grown tall and leafy. People were sitting on the park benches and children were playing on the basketball court. And then he remembered an old black man back when they were building the park, leaning on his shovel and saying that this was the best thing that had ever happened in Reno. Not the park itself, which was great, but the process of all these people coming together to build it. Pat Shannon Baker felt the wind of God's spirit. She caught the vision. She dreamed God's dream. And as a result, people from all walks of life came together, worked together, sweat together, and changed a small corner of their world for the better. So brothers and sisters, if we dream God's dreams, we participate in the birth of something that was not otherwise possible. But God's dreams are not just daydreams. Real dreamers dream with their eyes wide open. The Pentecost gift of the Holy Spirit challenges us to seek new visions and dream new dreams. And when the Spirit empowers us, as she empowered Peter and the other disciples on the day of Pentecost, we partner with God in making those dreams happen. So what dreams do this congregation need to have right now? What visions might God be calling this church to in the next phase of its history? As you know, next year we will celebrate our bicentennial, 200 years. That's a marvelous thing that we have the opportunity to do that. It's an opportunity to look back at what God has done over the course of those 200 years. 
But it's also an opportunity to look to the future, to seek for God's dreams for ourselves and for this church and for our community as we move into our third century. And so we need to be asking ourselves now and in the coming months what new ministry needs to be started in the community that only this congregation can do. What new groups need to be formed to nurture the faith of our members and of people in our community? What new ways of being God's people together need to be considered? Eleanor Roosevelt once said, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. Listen, God's dreams for us are bigger and better than anything we could ever imagine for ourselves. Only as we dream God's dreams can the church be the church in a hurting, hopeless world. This time in the life of the Presbyterian Church of Wilmington demands no less from each of us. So I invite you today, I invite you to open your heart to the wind of God's spirit that is blowing among us. Open your minds to what God wants to do in this place and among this people. Like Peter and the other disciples on the day of Pentecost, like Martin Luther King Jr., like Pat Shannon Baker, open your imagination to the dreaming of God's dreams. For when you do, nothing will ever be the same again. If not now, then when? If not here, then where? If not you, then who? Lord, grant us wisdom, grant us courage that we might be the church of Pentecost. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Now let us say what we believe by joining in the affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Again, thank you for your faithful stewardship. Let us dedicate the offering by singing the doxology. After two years, we will be joining each other at the table of the Lord. And we will have uh, a set of servers here and here. And so file up according to where you're sitting. We will have a runner. So if you are not comfortable coming forward, please know that Jean will come around with the bread and the juice so that you can participate in our family dinner. I will have at the front the, um, sit down. Thank you, Stan. I will have at the front here the prepackaged um, elements. So if you are not comfortable taking a piece of bread or taking an individual cup, know that it is, it's, we are covering all the bases that we know how to cover. Blessed, blessed are you who hunger for justice, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who thirst for righteousness, for you will drink deeply of the cup of joy. Blessed are you who yearn for reconciliation, for you will find peace. And blessed are you who are persecuted in the name of religion, for yours is the commonwealth of heaven. And blessed are we for Christ calls us to this table where there is room for everyone and plenty for all. Please know this is not Wilmington's table and this is not a Presbyterian table. This, this is God's table and all who trust in Jesus are welcome here. You are welcome here. Let us pray. Dear Father, God, thank you. Thank you for the gift of your creation. Thank you for caring for each one of us as your children. We offer thanks for the gift of Jesus, who was born in a stable, who lived a life of perfection as an example for us, and who died in sacrifice and obedience, and yet raised from the grave in victory to reconcile us once and for all with you, our Heavenly Father and Creator. Thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to be our comforter and our guide, our discerner and our intercessor. We rely on the Spirit every day to guide us in the ways that you show us. To feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, and to care for those who are without basic necessities to urge us into action so we are not content to know of a need, but are spurred into action for justice. Spirit, come. Come and live in us 
in this bread, in this cup, in your people, one in the body and one in the blood, one with Christ, one in ministry, one in this place and every place in all the world and in the world to come. Honor and praise to your holy and wonderful name now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And thanks and praise. On the night of his arrest, Jesus took the bread, and after saying the blessing, he broke. He broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take and eat. Likewise, after eating, he took the cup. He poured out the cup of blessing. And he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant, the new covenant between me and all of humanity. It is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And every time you take this cup and drink from it, remember, remember me. Let us pray now together with the confidence of brothers and sisters in Christ as the children of God. Let us pray as we were taught to pray by Christ. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, come. Come to the table of the Lord.
table. Thank you, Lord, for preparing a place for us to come, to come and thank you, to worship you, a place to come and find our dreams, our dreams that are God-breathed and spirit-whispered. We pray these things in gratitude in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus. Amen. Closing hymn is number 315, Every Time I Feel the Spirit. This is the first time we've come forward for communion in about, what, two and a half years? <laughs> we get out of the practice, you know, if we don't do things regularly, so we'll work out the glitches. But it was good to, I, I, my heart thrilled to see all of you coming down the aisle like that. So uh, anyway, I asked Sarah to give our closing prayer and blessing. I have to turn myself on. Precious God, we have come into this, to this sanctuary. We've tuned in online. We have carved out time for you. You, the giver of all of our gifts. You who invites us to the table of reconciliation, the table of blessing. Be with us and let us engage with your spirit this week as we walk out the doors and into a world desperate for your love and your healing and your reconciliation. Go with us. Help us tune in to your words as we embark on this week in service to you. We pray this prayer with grateful hearts and all God's people said, Amen. Now we have a choral. Congregational benediction to sing, so don't leave till we've sung it.